Hello and welcome to the Parkinson's Foundation Wellness Wednesday webinar. Today we return to our mental wellness series. Our discussion will focus on actively pursuing well-being in Parkinson's. I'm Krista Ellis, your host for today's webinar. Helping me behind the scenes are my colleagues Danielle Agpillo and Laura Cameron. We'd love to know more about our audience, so please share in the chat where you're joining us from today and say hello to your Parkinson's community. I'm joining you from Western North Carolina. We are recording today's presentation. You will receive a follow-up email from us with a link to today's recording and other resources in the coming days. Before we begin the formal webinar, I'd like to share a little bit about the Parkinson's Foundation. The mission of the Foundation is to make the lives better for people living with Parkinson's. Whether you're living with Parkinson's, caring for someone with Parkinson's, or working to end the disease, we are here to support you. To achieve our mission, we pursue three goals, improve care for everyone with Parkinson's, advance research toward a cure, and empower and educate our global Parkinson's community. Today's program is a great example of one of the things we are doing to help us meet these goals. The Parkinson's Foundation provides weekly educational and wellness programs virtually through our PD Health at Home series, including Mindfulness Mondays, Wellness Wednesdays, Fitness Fridays, our expert briefings with our Chief Scientific Officer, and Epi Salud on Casa. You can learn more and register for these programs by visiting parkinson.org slash PD Health, and one of my colleagues will put that link in the chat for you guys to access. I'd like to invite you to join us this Friday for our live Fitness Friday session. Today being International Day of Yoga and the Summer Solstice, it feels fitting to offer a live Fitness Friday session using yoga postures that explore a broad range of motion. Sign up today to attend the live stream at parkinson.org slash pdhealth. More than 110,000 veterans with Parkinson's disease receive care through the U.S. Department of Affairs. Many U.S. military veterans with Parkinson's have access to specialized medical care and financial assistance through the VA. We'll be hosting a webinar next Thursday, June 29th, Resources for Veterans with Parkinson's. We will explore resources and support services that the veterans have access to through the VA and the Parkinson's Foundation. You'll learn more and register to attend at parkinson.org slash vets resources. That link will also be shared in the chat with you. Today, our discussion focuses on actively pursuing well-being and Parkinson's. Living with a chronic and progressive disease like Parkinson's disease is no small feat. While PD can feel overwhelming at times, finding ways to connect with meaning and purpose, stay on track with your goals, and maintain a strong support network can improve quality of life. Building a healthy, balanced routine can also promote well-being. We'll learn from people with Parkinson's and PD specialists about ways to actively influence your mental narrative and improve your overall health during this candid virtual conversation. Following the conversation, we will have a live Q&A session. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, uh, my name is Paul French. Uh, I'm part of the panel here for the discussion we're going to have today. And uh, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2006 at the age of 49. Uh, worked for 10 years after that and then founded a support group and joined the uh, board of the Parkinson's Association of the Rockies. Um, and with that, we'll uh, Pass it on to the rest of the panel for people to introduce themselves. Uh, Greg. Hi, I'm Greg Pontone. I'm a psychiatrist uh, with specialty training in movement disorders and currently direct the neuropsychiatry program for Parkinson's at Johns Hopkins. Hi, good morning. I'm Brad McDaniels. I am a rehabilitation psychologist slash counselor and I work at the University of North Texas and just spend a lot of time researching Parkinson's disease and trying to find something that can improve lives. Hi, I'm Lou Eisenbrandt. I have been living with Parkinson's for 21 years. 
uh, generally thought of to be due to exposure to Agent Orange while I was a nurse in Vietnam in 1969 and 70. Uh, I also did just find out I have a little uh, gene factor that goes along with that. So um, I'm just here to tell you what you can do to hopefully make your life better living with Parkinson's. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I am a physical therapist and a faculty member at Boston University. I direct the Center for Neurorehabilitation and I specialize in the treatment of people with Parkinson's disease, particularly around uh, trying to get people to be able to exercise successfully with Parkinson's disease. All right, and uh, so we wanted to talk about today was just, um, Parkinson's is obviously a, a difficult and complicated disease. And um, the question is, how do you live well with Parkinson's? How do you maintain a high quality of, of life? Are there universal aspects to that? And then how do you actually make it happen? And um, with that, we'll just open it up for general discussion. Um, so just jump in, anybody has an idea wants to start? Well, since it's a daily life for me, um, I will be happy to, to open the conversation. Um, I particularly I'm interested in the mental uh, and psychological aspects of living with Parkinson's. There is much emphasis placed on the physical uh, appearances that people portray when they have Parkinson's. Although I will say at the very top, anything you hear today, every person is different with Parkinson's. There are no two people that are alike. So just because your neighbor has tremor doesn't mean you have to have tremor to be diagnosed with Parkinson's. But having said that, there one of the things that I have found over the time that I've had this is very few people realize the emotional and mental aspects that go along with Parkinson's. And I think that's an area that needs much more attention um, I started out my Parkinson's life with a depression, which is very common in Parkinson's. Uh, I wasn't depressed because I had Parkinson's. I was depressed because I don't have enough of the chemicals that make us happy. So it's more a, a physiological depression than it is just, oh, woe is me, I've got, I've got Parkinson's. Yeah, and to follow on with that, Lou, I think one of the complications is people tend to not like to talk about depression or about some of the mental aspects. And I, I was really surprised when I brought up my support group. You know, I unexpectedly would burst into tears over things that really didn't make me that sad. And half of the group immediately responded like, oh, yeah, I do that, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just I'll just kind of segue on what Lou just shared. And, you know, I've been fortunate to do some work with with Greg and um, Indu Subramanian. And we've started talking about this concept of demoralization. And, you know, it, it fits right in with this mental health stuff, Lou, that you're talking about. And it, it it's a little difficult because it's different than depression, but it's very similar. Right. And it has some different qualities to it. And it really is an inability to cope with something some serious change in your life and it leaves people feeling hopeless and helpless loss of meaning in their life diminished self-esteem so it's all of this stuff that you can imagine right that when you get that diagnosis of parkinson's disease and you lose things in your life that were deemed important to you now all of a sudden you've got to try to adjust and deal with this new stuff and um, the treatments are very similar, right? I, I know Greg, and he may talk about what you do to treat a chemical depression is different, but there are certainly some psychosocial interventions that can be done with depression and demoralization that are effective. And one of those that I'm is in my research focus is meaning in life. And, you know, the meaning in life literature is fraught with information about the benefits of someone who finds meaning in life. 
And, um, you know, maybe as we go through this today, I can talk further about what exactly one can do to foster meaning in life. Lou mentioned um, the physical aspects seem to be somewhat overplayed, right? I mean, Parkinson's is, is described as a movement disorder and not as a mental disorder. Um, uh, there is a lot of mind-body interactions, and exercise is certainly something that helps uh, stimulate you and pull people out of depression or, or give them the ability to cope uh, with things better. And um, I know Terry, that seems to be your your area of expertise. I know a lot of people have difficulty exercising. Every everybody knows it's good for you. Everybody everybody sort of oh I should be doing more of that, but it's really hard to do. And so often I, when I um, sort of introduce exercise, especially to people that aren't already exercising, it's, it's about why, you know, not only do we sort of spend time talking about the physiological benefits of exercise, but, but why is exercise important, you know, to you as a person? And, you know, some people don't, aren't able to really exercise just for the sake of exercising don't have that motivation, you know, to just exercise because it's good for you. But what's really important, I think, is to talk about how exercise helps you engage in the things in your life that are meaningful. You know, if, if you're exercising, you're getting these physical and psychological benefits that then actually help you engage in meaningful things in your life. And talking about what are those meaningful things? What are the kinds of things that you want to engage in? And then how would exercise help you access those things? I think that's sort of an area that's overlooked and that we could spend more time talking about with people rather than just do this this many times a week for this long. You know, that can just seem overwhelming. And one of the other things that, that has come up in conversation is effectively having the confidence that you can control the outcome um, that you're not just a victim um, and i don't know if uh greg if you want to uh expound on that a little bit yes absolutely so you know as dr mcdaniels brad mentioned earlier we started collaborating and he said there are all these tools and behaviors that help in other chronic diseases that i don't see being applied to parkinson's and one of them uh, was self-efficacy and this is fundamentally the belief that you can change your situation that you control important variables that uh, determine outcomes in your life, whether they're disease outcomes, social outcomes, just that you are an active player. And so, uh, so many times we see people who, uh, you know, get diagnosed with a disease, whether it be Parkinson's or something else, and they, they take a passive role. They just, you know, the doctor says, you know, do this, take this medicine, and they do that. And then they, they sort of, they're in maybe denial, or they're demoralized. Uh, you know, as Brad had mentioned earlier, and what we really want to do is restore agency to people. We want to let them know that what they do and the choices they make have a big impact on the disease. And so, you know, one of the things that was really surprising to me as I started, you know, working with Dr. McDaniels was that intervening uh, to improve self-efficacy has a bigger impact on quality of life and global health outcomes than the severity of the disease. So whether you're two years in or 10 years in, self-efficacy has a bigger impact on your day-to-day -day function and life. If I could jump in right here, I think that uh, something that I didn't identify early on, but after a few years did, and that is the role of apathy. Um, I used to think it was just fatigue, it was just, you know well that's just the way it is and then i read an article about apathy and i i said that's it that is exactly what it is and therefore there are mornings that i get up and i just go oh i know i need to do this this and this but i just don't feel like doing it so then i talk to myself which is fine if nobody else is around um but that's also a place where i think 
a care partner can make a big difference because uh, I, I, my husband had hip replacement surgery about a year ago. And of course, I was not physically in a situation to be hoisting him out of bed and things like that. And our son came and spent three weeks uh, with us, our grown son. And it made all the difference in the world because he was saying to my husband what people, other people, or my husband normally would be saying to me, which is, you can do this. You're, that's okay. You don't have to do it right now, but let's sometime before noon, let's get this done. And so I found that that made a huge difference having somebody else now not like a drill sergeant i spent time in the army and i don't want to be told you must do it at this hour um and since i'm i'm not gainfully employed i can you know kind of make my own hours but just someone saying remember before the day is out we need to make sure we do this yeah and um so you mentioned a care partner being important in overcoming apathy um, I also would, would throw in a pitch for support groups and exercise classes, which sort of have a similar aspect of, you know, setting expectations that are going to be there. And if you're not there, your friends are going to call, call you up and say, you know, where, where were you? Um, and having some structure to it makes it a lot easier, I think, to engage. And then that also uh, becomes a socialization factor. You get out of the house, you um you know gossip with people um and it turns into a little support group and, and social group and uh i think there's a lot of the same things that, that a care partner can do on their on their own uh i think i can jump in and, and talk a little bit about how that might apply to exercise um you know it, it getting yourself to exercise is really hard and so some of the things lou and 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 paul that you just mentioned um you know going to an exercise class or meeting your neighbor to take a walk you know just having to show up at a certain time and meet other people you're much more likely to do it and follow through than left to your own day that is not scheduled that being said uh we we spend a lot of time um talking to people about how to build habits so how to build exercise into people's sort of everyday routines just to make it easier. So for example, if you don't set a routine and you're constantly asking yourself all day long, oh, I should exercise, but oh, I don't feel like it right now, or maybe I'll do it later, or, you know, it's there's a lot of effort involved in thinking about it, contemplating whether you should do it, procrastinating, you know, particularly with things like depression and apathy, as you said, Lou, then it's really hard. And you get these thoughts in your head, these, you know, sometimes we call them unhelpful thoughts, like, oh, I'm not gonna exercise today because why bother? I haven't done it this week. There's no point in trying to do it. I'm not that good at it. And that actually then leads to reduced self-efficacy, lower confidence in your ability to succeed. So what can we do about that? Well, we can try to do things like build habits and make it a little easier to integrate into your everyday life. For example, when you get up out of bed in the morning, you go into the bathroom and you brush your teeth. You don't think about brushing your teeth typically. You don't try, you're not making a decision as to whether you should brush your teeth or not. It's just sort of automatic. It happens. It's part of your daily routine and it makes it less effortful. And so with exercise, for example, um, if you always pick up the mail, you walk down the end of your driveway and you pick up the mail every day around two o'clock, just as an example. Well, what you could build in is you go down the end of your driveway, you, you walk for 20 minutes in the neighborhood, you get the mail on your way back and you come in. And if you make that part of a daily routine, then it's not something you think about. You just sort of more automatically engage in the task. It becomes part of your, you know, sort of routine. And those, those are just some of the tips 
you know, we try to give people just just one example to to make it a bit easier. Yeah, and I think one of the challenges is that, as you said, exercise is sometimes hard for people to do, and it isn't necessarily by itself a fulfilling thing. It makes you feel better. It helps you cope. Um, but uh, Brad, you were talking about um, finding meaning in, in life. Yeah. And, um, or you know, making it meaningful. I was a competitive distance runner for 20 years or 30 years. And so exercise actually was very fulfilling to me, but it's not for everybody. Um, how do you suggest somebody goes about finding what's important to them? Anything, any outcome that's positive gets better when people have meaning in life across the board, anything you want to look at. And so I, I began doing some research and I, I just got a paper published that that showed a relationship between people who have higher meaning in life and lower apathy and Parkinson's disease. And so then the question becomes, so what, right? That's kind of what, what the end goal is for anybody who does research is how can I affect change in that construct? And so what, what we've come up with is there, we've got to find things in your life that you truly enjoy. You talked about running. It, the literature is clear that the top three things for most people are spirituality, relationships, and work. And you can see when you get diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, for many, you gradually frequently begin to pull away from work for a variety of reasons. Your roles change at home. And now all of a sudden you're saying, I used to be this, now I'm this, everything's gone. And so it's a, it's maybe you find uh, meaning in a hobby like exercise, right? We've got people who are involved in rock steady boxing and that's the thing in their week that they just love to do. And so you can find it in nature. You might find it uh, in organizations, things that you engage in in the community. Um, being out in nature, I've talked to people who just, they love to go out and do bird watching, right? And it's something that brings them pleasure. And so it's part of it is finding that thing, whatever it is, and then do more of it, right? I mean, there is some counseling intervention, solution focused therapy that says, find what works and do more of it. If it's not working, stop. That's a very simplistic way for me to describe that to you, but that's really what they say. The other part of it is doing those things with other people. Because, you know, you already mentioned, Paul, uh, about, you know, the advantage of having social connection and a care partner. And when we engage in these things with someone else and we give part of ourselves to others in an altruistic way, we get meaning from that. And you know, when we help someone else foster their meaning in their life, ours gets better. So Lou, you um, you said you uh, started out quite depressed and you managed to overcome it. Um, can you talk about how you did that and were there other attributes of your life that you pulled on to, to get you there? Well, I think uh, growing up, I was the oldest of five, so, um, and we were all spaced like two and a half years apart. So I had to be resilient and responsible at a pretty early age. Uh, my youngest sibling is 11 years younger than I am. Um, so I think it came to me at an early time to um, be responsible and, and to, like I said, be resilient. Um, if there was something that needed to be done, it was, well, you're the oldest, you should have known better, um, which which instantly gave me responsibility. I think my time in the military and certainly serving as an emergency room uh, nurse in a war zone teaches you to be resilient because if you don't, I there were there were times, days that you just went, oh, no more carnage, but I didn't have the option. I think the biggest problem for me with the depression was um, simply having to get past the, I am not going to live any longer. I think that was the hardest part was thought I'm not going to, I'm not going to have 
my children aren't going to be married I'm not going to grow old with grandchildren and all that stuff and once I convinced myself that that was not true um I would say to people don't tell me you know somebody who had Parkinson's oh but they died yesterday I didn't want to hear that I want to hear that you know somebody has Parkinson's and they've had it for 15 years and they're still playing golf um so uh, surrounding yourself with positive people makes a big difference too so staying active surrounding yourself with good people and I have to be honest with you I've been on an antidepressant for our 20 years uh and I don't we've talked at a couple of times about decreasing the amount and my my advice to my neurologist is we're not going to rock the boat um but one thing I think you need to be careful about is um you say you try to avoid negative people but there are realities you have to deal with yes and, and I, I you know when I talk to people a lot I talk to them about um something called Stockdale's paradox which was from a admiral who was in the Hanoi Hilton who had to face brutal conditions but never gave up his belief that he would overcome and end up with a good life at the end and you know so when somebody points out you know an issue or a problem that's not necessarily they're being negative you have to face face those actual realities um and you know the, the other aspect of my life from besides being a runner was I was a uh integrated circuit design manager and uh designer and essentially all my life I've been a problem solver and so I think you know I think what I brought to my Parkinson's is okay there are some realities here I have to deal with but given that what is it I can do to make things better and get the best possible outcome from it and I think the the real challenge <clears throat> is is getting and maintaining that belief that you know even as, as my physical physical condition degrades i can still be fulfilled and find meaning uh in what i'm doing okay um any last thoughts that anybody uh I, anybody I think, has anything they want to make sure they say before we uh wrap up yeah i had a lou i think made a really important point you know we're talking about uh making good choices and having self-agency self-efficacy you know taking control but what about when you have depression or apathy which are you know clinical syndromes related to the disease you know uh, you can't just talk yourself out of a major depressive disorder so when you have these barriers to the things you're supposed to do what what's the answer and I, and I think Lou I just sort of wanted to pull forward you know her her sort of description of her struggles with depression she's on an antidepressant so almost always for major depression you need medication and so once uh, it's been identified that you have a major depressive disorder uh, medications and therapy are absolutely the best way to get out of an episode in a similar way about one third of people are going to suffer from apathy, which is a lack of initiative. So even when you know that exercise is important or being social is important, you lack the initiative to, you know, to start these things and to engage. And, uh, you know, as, as Brad said, you, you, medication doesn't necessarily impact uh, apathy that much. You can try dopamine agonists in certain cases. You can try acetylcholinesterase, but they help a little bit. And so, you know, fundamentally, I think these statements about caregivers and social networks and, um, you know, things like that are that's, you know, what you want to surround yourself with are, are these supports that can help initiate things when you can't either because you're depressed or because you're apathetic. And, uh, you know, when we talk about apathy, whether it's from depression or from an apathy syndrome, 
having structure is important in, in this external sort of initiative so that if you know on Thursdays you have cards, right? So you have your, your coffee clutch and you play cards, that's an anchor and also a sort of a stimulus to start a behavior, right? And so, uh, you know, I can't tell you how important that is for apathy. It's more important than the medications. And then Terry mentioned habits. And to me, habits are just modular structure, right? They're sort of little, little structure that you can interpose on your day, whether it's the ritual of brushing your teeth, right? There's sort of a structure to it. You pick up the toothbrush with toothpaste on. And so I would say that at, at this point, whether you're depressed, or apathetic or having no problems developing habits is the way to maintain best function over time and that's not just if you're a person with parkinson's but for any of us because uh, you know terry mentioned that there's less cost to initiating behaviors that are habituated and so i just want to throw out two titles and, and these are things that you can look up on the web or that we can send out uh, links to uh, Charles Duhigg uh, did a book called The Power of Habit, where he talks over, uh, you know, sort of the overarching principles of habit. And then if you want almost a manual for it, uh, James Clear uh, just wrote a book a couple years ago called Atomic Habits. And these are things that absolutely will introduce structure into your day and life and also help you attain goals that seem sometimes too large if you were to take them all in one bite it, it teaches you to sort of how to incrementally achieve a goal by uh, approximating the goal over time through habit and so i i think these are just fundamental skills uh, that will get you out of trouble and and maintain a, a forward path for you yeah and and again drawing drawing on my athletic background um you know one way i look at it is is to really do your best you you need a team you need a coaching staff which is essentially <laughs> a set of professionals you know you need a neurologist you know speech pathologist physical therapist occupational therapist um you need a role model it really helps to have a mentor you need cheerleaders who are who are urging you on as you're going through it. You need a team. You need fellow travelers who are going through the same thing you're going through. You need fans, you know, people who are emotionally invested in the outcome of what you're doing. Um, and you can't be afraid to fail and come back and try again. And I think that's that's one of the things that's tough when you're dealing with depression or apathy, something goes wrong, not letting yourself go down the rabbit hole of, of oh, this is all, all terrible, you know, but you know, I, I've run a dozen marathons and effectively I've dropped out of, of half of them, but I still consider myself a successful marathoner. <laughs> right. Okay, um, I think we're about out of time. So, and we had a lot of discussion around some of the keys, which seem to be exercise is good for everybody all the time. Um, having a positive attitude and maintaining the belief in, in a good outcome. And then believing and understanding that you actually have control over that outcome and you can influence it. So those seem to be some of the universal things. And hopefully we gave you some uh, tips and ideas of of how to get there. So I thought this was a, was a good discussion and thanks to all the panelists and we'll, we'll see you later. Oh, welcome back everyone. If our panelists could please join me on camera we have so many wonderful questions to uh, to get through. Uh, first of all, just um, want to thank each of you for the time that you shared and that really brilliant and insightful conversation uh, about the well being and living with Parkinson's disease. And also all of you who are joining us live who have been so active and sharing your questions and living well with Parkinson's disease. Uh, we, we did get an overwhelming response to questions. So I'll start with the ones that are most relevant to our topic today. And we'll um, use the time that we have to address as many questions as we can. 
Oh, so Dr. McDaniels, one mm. question that is, um, you know, very near and dear to my heart that someone posed, um, how well does meditation help deal uh, or help us cope or, uh, you know, really live well with psychological issues that might be associated with Parkinson's disease? Yeah, great question. Um, I think meditation has got plenty of evidence behind it. I think it's it's quite effective uh, for anxiety. It's quite effective. You know, I, I think it's, it, it is a coping strategy, right, that people use when they get frustrated, when they get anxious, when they get depressed, um, meditation works. So I think that the biggest challenge that I see with people with meditation is, number one, they don't stick with it long enough because they think they stink at it, uh, which is really... Uh, it takes time, right? It's one of those things that you've got to practice. Really, it goes into the talk about habits, right? It's about getting into a habit of doing this. And, you know, I tell people regularly, there are a ton of apps online, uh, mindfulness meditation apps that are very effective um, in helping you learn how to meditate for three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever you have time for. But uh, the evidence is clear that uh, it, it can really help ground you. It can help you deal with some of these struggles in a more effective way. Um, so I, I, I think it's a benefit to add to anybody's, you know, treatment regimen that they're on for sure. Thank you for that. Um, Paul or Lou, both of you mentioned uh, apathy and how you have experienced it through your journey in Parkinson's disease. Can you share some ways that you overcame this experience of apathy? Well, uh, I can say that basically for me is I talk to myself, which fortunately I don't have a house full of people who, you know, think that's very odd, but uh, it helps talking to myself helps me in many ways, not just the apathy, uh, but also like I experienced freezing, which is part of, can be part of Parkinson's where you, you're your brain wants you to move on, but your body says, I don't think so. And so I count. And if it still isn't working, I count even louder. So fortunately, my husband is used to hearing me count. But that helps me with, it helps me concentrate and keep my mind on things. And I think that's what it does with the apathy. It's like, because with apathy, you want to just push something off for another day or another time. But it says to you, no, we're doing this now. Uh, so I have found that that is that is a big part of it. And I I totally agree with the, the um, surrounding yourself with with good people because you'll see somebody. As a matter of fact, they're in the community. Well, I should say the suburb uh, um, well community where we live. They're all houses, but they're individuals and. Um, five of us have Parkinson's and it's, there are only like 42 houses. Wow. Um, so one of them will say, well, they're all men say, well, now I got to get out and walk because I saw my wife saw you out walking around the block again. So, <laughs> you know, you can, you can be affecting someone without even really knowing it. Um, so I think that, you know, concentrating, and and it rolls in with the meditation all together, being just being aware of where you are at a particular time and saying, no, we're not going to do it later. We're going to do it now. Yeah. So is that an example of, of how you would use this inner dialogue, right? We're talking about this narrative that we have with ourselves. No, Lou, not tomorrow, not next week. We're taking the walk today. Is yes. That and actually, I was when I was growing up, I was Louise, so I use that, and it's even more incentive. You remember when you're when you were little, and your mom wanted you to was not exactly happy. She'd use all all of the names that you that you had. So I use my given name, and it gets me motivated. I love that tool. Thank you for sharing that, Lou. Paul, do you have anything else you'd like to share as a as a a way to overcome apathetic emotions? Yeah, um, a couple things. Um, one thing that's really simple is actually to just write things down. I mean, make a list and just just then focus on it and, and check it off. And that helps you feel like you're achieving progress towards things. 
And then again, uh, as Lou said, and we mentioned in the video, just having um, sort of an obligation or a, a commitment or a standing appointment, you know, for an exercise class or telling your your spouse or caregiver, okay, we need to do this, and then letting them nag you to say, okay, it's time to do it. Um, I think are, are also effective. Thank you, Paul. Dr. Porchinkula, we one of our participants shares that they love to exercise. Unfortunately, their progression with Parkinson's has really challenged their mm -hmm. balance. Do you have any suggestions for our viewers who, who may be experiencing the same challenges? Yeah, so the great thing about exercise, it's like there are different modes of exercise. Um, we always kind of like the, the popular ones are kind of like walking oriented, which is great. But as, as people's function change over time, walking may not be the safest and it can create kind of like these challenges in achieving this habitual behavior of walking regularly. Um, but there are other modes of exercise like cycling, for instance, like stationary cycling has been shown to be effective in it has disease mitigating effects on Parkinson's. Um, other seated exercises can also be options. Alternatively, if these balance challenges or walking challenges are modifiable through physical therapy, what we would typically do, can we modify it? help the person come up with strategies on how they can cope with these challenges, then that may allow them to engage in more walking um, as form, of, as form of, a, of, of an exercise. Thank you, Dr. Porchinkula. And something, you know, I've, I've heard time and time again is meeting in my own, you know, exercise and fitness goals, meeting myself where I'm at. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Absolutely. Yep. So kind of like, you know, identifying what is um, a, a safe exercise mode for the person and something that is also engaging. I think, I think the engagement fun factor is also a, a key component in um, facil facilitating something that's sustainable over a long period of time. It's something you enjoy, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. along those lines, it, it's interesting. Um, they started a ping pong class locally for Parkinson's people and people who have tremendous balance problems by simply putting like one finger on the table to balance themselves, can stand and play ping pong for extended periods of time when they basically can't walk or move uh, smoothly on their own. So yeah, um, there, there are a lot of, I think, different options that people can try and surprise themselves. Absolutely, Paul, that, that's a great observation. Um, so what people are usually doing, they are substituting this loss of balance for something that's sensory, right? They're, touching, near, uh, lightly touching onto something. And the same thing can be said also with external cues, like mu listening to music, that, that is a pacer. And a lot of people are finding that to be helpful in walking. So, so some of these strategies can be um, helpful in promoting exercise. Thank you for all the input. Uh, Dr. Pantone, <laughs> a comment uh, that Lou made in the beginning, understanding that she wasn't experiencing depression because she was depressed of getting a diagnosis of Parkinson's, but it was in fact the chemical imbalance that Parkinson's disease caused. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, it's normal to sort of have negative emotions, fears about the future, and maybe even some demoralization when you get bad news. And Depression, though, is is different. It's it can overlap with those things, the normal psychological reaction to bad news. The difference is it doesn't go away. It persists and it interferes with your ability to function on a day to day basis. And I think, you know, sometimes people uh, can recognize that or the people around them can help them recognize that they're experiencing something other than the normal psychological reaction. But other times it takes a professional. And so I, what I would say to people is, if you notice that your day-to-day -day life is not you know, going according to what you've experienced in the past, it's worthwhile to sort of be screened for depression. And the other tricky thing about depression is you don't necessarily have to have frank sadness to have the clinical syndrome of depression. In fact, I think that's probably... The, the major way that depression fools us is that people won't necessarily feel sad or depressed, but what they will have 
is a decreased interest and enjoyment of their usual activities. And so what I always counsel is that if the person themselves or the people around them notice that they've withdrawn or decreased their activity and the things they've normally enjoyed or found pleasurable, that's enough of a signal to get uh, sort of evaluated. Thank you, Dr. Panton. Dr. McDaniels, anything to add to the question? Yeah, you know, I think that, that Greg's right on and he's certainly the one to address that. But I think one of the interesting things that he said was finding this, this differentiation between depression and demoralization is a challenge. And, you know, Jerome Frank was the guy who, who coined the term demoralization back in the 60s. And uh, one of the things that, that he talks about is the differentiation being that demoralization, he calls it coping incompetence right, which is a, a pejorative word when we use that in a way, but understand what he means. It's just an inability to cope effectively with the change that you're experiencing in your life versus depression, which is anhedonia, which is what Greg talked about, is inability to experience pleasure. And um, I, I think that one of the other things that we've looked at in a couple of recent papers we've talked about is that this changes with people with Parkinson's disease, and it... it uh, it kind of morphs along the progression of the disease, right? That you you come in, you're diagnosed, you have all of these thoughts, these feelings, these negative emotions associated with the diagnosis. And then maybe over time, you begin to come back to some normalcy, if you will, in your life. But then you begin to experience off episodes. And now all of a sudden, these feelings are coming back. I'm, I'm getting depressed. I'm getting demoralized. I don't want to go out in the community anymore because of these symptoms. And, and that's the thing is that is being paying attention, having people in your life who can see when you're maybe going on a downward trajectory because of something going on with your PD. So it's a, uh, to me, what, what I see is it's, it's a constant ebb and flow, right? You're good for a while and then something new pops up and now I've got to deal with it. Um, so it's tough. Thank you for that, Dr. McDaniels. Lou, I thought it was really, um, you know, synchronistic that you mentioned something about driving before we went live in the webinar. And we've had a couple of questions come through about driving and just these changes that we either choose to embrace or reject. And um, so if you would, you know, just share how your husband has become your designated driver and, and maybe share with our community here how you've really, um, embraced that change and, and you know, maybe perhaps losing the freedom of driving. Well, you know, I've, I, because of my books and things, I've done a lot of speaking and I did a class uh, for several years, <coughs> excuse me, about living with Parkinson's. And I would always say, well, now I have not experienced this, but I'm sure losing your ability to drive is, is can be devastating. Well, it's easy to say that in class until your family has a powwow and comes up with, mom, you've made a couple wrong turns in oncoming traffic and you took half of the garage with you when you pulled the car in. And I think it's time you gave us the keys. So when it first had the first day, I was really de depressed about it. And it and it's not any different, I suppose, from any other privilege that we have that we have to give up. But it certainly curtails your activity and your ability to to uh, mingle. I don't miss the inability to get in the car and drive from Kansas City to Colorado. That that doesn't bother me. It's the little things. It's the, oh, I need to grab a birthday card for somebody, or uh, the as in our case, the milk is past due, and so we need a new bottle of milk. So I can't just hop in the car and go get a bottle of milk. But when I realize now sitting alongside my spatial issues with Parkinson's, there are times that I want to say to my husband, oh my gosh, you're too close to the curb. And he's not. It's just the way I perceive it. Mm -hmm. So that tells me I am doing 
not just myself a favor, but everyone else on the road. Um, and you it really, when you think about it and realize, um, it, I, I guess in a way it's not any different than anybody who's impaired by some other means and should not be driving. You have to think of the other person or other persons. And if you have someone in the car with you as well. So it, it, it threw me back at the beginning and uh, for one day of tears. And then I said, well, that's one less thing I have to worry about. And I have a good, uh, between my husband and a good group of friends, uh, I still play golf. And so one of the, two of the ladies have vowed to never make me miss golf because I didn't get a ride, they picked me up. So you find out that this, this is this, when we talked about surrounding yourself with good people and positive people and uh, driving is just another aspect of that. So uh, I, I really don't miss it except for those little bitty, you have to rely on somebody else to get something for you, but it's for your own good and for everybody else's. Thank you, Lou, for sharing that. Paul, did you want to make a comment about the driving? I saw you came off mic. Oh, um, a couple things. You know, one is that that is, is one of the realities that you you need to accept, um, and I think that's a real hard one for people. Um, but as, as Lou said, there are there are lots of um, of uh, options. Um, I found actually a did like a little polling of neurologists, and your neurologist will very seldom, at least the ones I've talked to, will very seldom tell you you need to stop driving. Um, so I think there's more of the family is or self-observation. Um, and then you also have to make sure you get advice from the right people. Because I had somebody say in one of my support groups, you know, my wife says I'm a terrible driver. I need to give up driving. I said, well, what did she think of your driving before you got Parkinson's? She said he, she thought I was a terrible driver. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Paul, for sharing that and giving us a laugh. I know that driving is a very sensitive subject uh, when it comes to embracing change um, in the older stages of our lives, right? So if you are hearing from your wife or a partner or a friend that your driving scares them or that you're noticing your reactions are a little bit slower, there is a way uh, to be evaluated for driving that takes the family unit out of it. And that's through your occupational therapist. So if there's tension between family members and friends and you yourself feel confident and driving and you and you want really a, a professional to say this, you are safe to drive on the roads. Other people are safe with you driving on the roads. See an occupational therapist and they can give you a driving evaluation. Yeah, and I actually recommend that because it also reduces your liability if you get into an accident and somebody finds out you have Parkinson's. If you can say, I went and got evaluated for driving and I got the okay from my occupational therapist and doctor, um, that puts you in a much better position. So I have a question here um, that I really think each of us could, could address. Um, we have several care partners or caregivers joining us today who are attending um, to learn more about their loved one living with Parkinson's disease and they're, they're saying how can I educate myself uh, or better understand how and when to push my loved one to exercise to go to support groups to do these things to support them in this journey through Parkinson's how far do I push and when do I back off. Well, I guess I, I can address that. I would say nudge rather than push. Mm. Um, and if you, in our case, we've been married for 52 years. So I pretty much know what, what button to push and what button not to push. But I think the important thing is to realize for the patient, that this is a big change for the caregiver too. And I try to do that. I try to not interfere, schedule things that take away from his, he's a golfer, that take away from his golfing time. We have a lot of activities going on 
grandkids to pick up from school and various and sundry other things. But I think if you try really hard to coordinate schedules, uh, so if there's something that uh, the care partner has been doing on a regular basis, what, whether it's sports or cards or visiting with somebody or having lunch, which is what my husband's doing now, I think it's important to keep in mind the needs of the caregiver as well as the person who is living with with Parkinson's. I, I think I think just re respecting every both situations, your your space and your time, because the, if you can get burned out pretty quickly with caregiving if you're just the needy one. I think, you know, Lou, you made several, I think, really important points there that are not appreciated until you're in the in the situation. And, you know, one is that before the disease, there was a dynamic between the couple, right? They had a dynamic and they each had their social roles, if you will. And now the disease has changed those roles. So in addition to, in this case, being spouses, now someone is over time increasingly becoming uh, involved in the caregiving role, which is a different role, and sometimes a role that's in conflict with that spousal role, right? Because you were independent entities before, and now you have one who's giving direction. And so I, I think that mutual respect that Lou mentioned is probably the key, is just sort of A, recognizing that there's a change in that dynamic, and then very explicitly and intentionally being mindful of the that extra effort for respecting each other's independence and i think that's probably the best you're going to do because it's a moving target as well you know as the disease progresses there'll be more infringement from the caregiving role on the other roles whether they're spousal or sometimes you know the caregiver may be a a, a child right a daughter or a son or a, a sister or a brother and so I, I think really universally i i don't think it can be said better than what lou said is that you just have to maintain that respect for, you know, the dynamic and the roles. Yeah. And I think I'll piggyback on that, Greg. Um, I think one of the things that's beneficial, and I think the wording is rather than push, pull, right? Say, let's go. I, I, so many of you know, my mom has Parkinson's and I have this discussion with my mom and dad frequently. I go, dad, why don't you go with mom to the gym rather than saying you need to go to the gym? Right. There's a big difference in that, because, number one, we know Parkinson's is a family disease. Right. It's not just my mom who's affected. It's everybody who's around her. And the same things that benefit my mom benefit my dad or any caregiver. Right. You're struggling with stress. You're struggling with demoralization. You're struggling with anxiety. And you go to the gym and you do something. Those things tend to get better. My dad will go to support groups with my mom. He'll go to the breakout with the care partners and my mom goes to the, the people with Parkinson's group, right? So I think it's how can we continue to try to forge this relationship as one as we traverse the ground with this Parkinson's disease that neither one of us understand, right? Yeah, and I really like that, uh, Brad, also from the standpoint that people with Parkinson's have trouble making decisions. <laughs> and so if you essentially turn it into a a decision ahead of time let's go do this instead of do you want to do this it probably helps a lot um I'll, the things i'll volunteer are just like every person with parkinson's is different every marriage is different and i wouldn't want to pretend that there's any way you can really predict the dynamics between any two people um but i think the one thing that's really important is just to to communicate about it and especially if you have checkpoints, you know, once a month you get together and just talk about how's it going, or if you have your doctor appointment is due, you get together and talk about, you know, what do we want to tell the doctor, what do we want to talk about, what's going on, um, and keeping that communication open is important. Um, you know, my wife will ask me, do I need to nag you about this? <laughs> I'm going to piggyback on these great ideas and linking it back to habit since we talked about habit in, in the, the previous panel discussion. Um, so there are ways on how habits are being triggered, whether internally the person kind of like knows when to actually do it, but there's going to be, there, there's going to come a time when external cues from your, from your family, from your support um, system would be beneficial in starting or igniting this uh, um, um, habit loop, if you will. So, so I think kind of like determining when the right time is based on 
how successful the person is in, in doing these um, routines. Thank you, doctors and our experts living with Parkinson's. This truly has been, um, I hope, a life altering discussion um, between people living with Parkinson's and those who are in the field of supporting our community of people living with Parkinson's. So many thanks to all of you who participated in today's webinar. And please know that a follow up email will be sent for um, information and any other resources that were provided and discussed during today's event. And as we close the event, there will be a survey that will be prompted um, at the end of the webinar. So please give us your feedback on today's program. Just a friendly reminder that next week we are hosting uh, the first part of our four part series for our veterans living with Parkinson's disease on Thursday, June 29th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Join us for resources for veterans with Parkinson's. You can learn more and register to attend at parkinson.org slash vets resources. And Danielle just put that link in the chat for you guys. We had so many thoughtful and compassionate questions asked in today's webinar. I'm so sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, for those of you who had a question go unanswered, please reach out to our helpline by calling one 800 4 pd info or email helpline at parkinson.org. You can use that same contact information to order our free resources, educational book series, and our hospital safety kit. We thank you for joining us today and hope to see you again soon. A major congratulations to Colleen McKee, Laura Cameron, and my team behind the scenes who made this mental wellness series such a success. Thank you all, and we'll see you on Zoom somewhere soon.